people say some girls should be seen in a certain way and others shouldn't be seen at all. One, two, three, four! Cut me so mean, break my nose! I don't want to be Botox free! Oh, that's not very good. Oh, no, 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 Good evening. Hi, I'm Zora Musa. <laughs> Thanks, that helps. <laughs> um, when I joined Mama Cash almost five years ago, it was so exciting because I knew I would be contributing to supporting the countless women, girls, and trans people and intersex people every day around the world who are creating change in our communities and in our societies for all of us. They're working to create a more free, a more equal, and a more just society. Their courage and creativity are amazing to me. The risks they run and the cost to themselves are huge, and they do their work with so few resources, which is where we come in. And us. Mama Cash supports these groups by providing them with money, but also sounding boards and access to networks. Many of you donate to Mama Cash, and I want to thank you here tonight for that help. I also want to thank, thank the Dutch Postcode Lottery. With their support, and for tonight as well, we are able to start a project called Create Equality. Create Equality will help us to fund feminist groups who work on that sweet spot, tonight's sweet spot, where art and activism meet. We don't always like to talk about it, but money is crucial to build um, social justice movements. It's what enables people with vision, with creativity, with perseverance, to go out and fight the fights that we need them to fight for the things that are right. People do that in different ways, depending on their talents and their passions. Some people write, some people paint, some people organize demonstrations, some people put on gorilla masks and call out the baloney. We are going to welcome here tonight some of the members of a group of activists who have been calling out sexism, racism, and corruption in the arts, politics, and pop culture since the 1980s. They wear gorilla masks, and they use aliases like Frida Kahlo and Zubeda Aga. The reason why they choose to remain anonymous is that it's not about them, but about their cause. To name exclusion and, exclusion, exclusion and injustice in art and culture. And in reality, most activists do work in this anonymity. The activists we support at Mama Cash are constantly creating change, but their contributions often go unseen and completely unacknowledged. They aren't household names, and most of them will never make it into the history books. But they are shaping and reshaping the course of history 100%. For some, anonymity isn't a choice. They remain anonymous because they are ignored or actively silenced. Some are, are not permitted anonymity. They are outed, outed and targeted for their activism. Mama Cash backs and honors all of them. For those of you who work in the arts world, some of this will sound familiar. Women artists have long been left out of the narrative. It's a world that's crying out for some critical self-reflection and an opening of its doors to new voices. Why is this so important? Because artists hold up a mirror to society. They reveal the lies, the secrets and silences, the hypocrisy, the emperor's nakedness. They also show beauty, often in the most unexpected places. Artists help us collectively imagine different futures, different possibilities. And in that imagining, we need to include all voices including and especially those that have been excluded. International Women's Day, today's awesome day, 
is a day to celebrate everything women create and achieve. The activists and the artists. The painters, the writers, musicians, poets, dancers, makers. Those dreamers imagining and crafting our better worlds to come. Please do allow yourself to be inspired by everything you see and hear tonight. Maybe put on a superhero mask of your own and support our movements in any way that you can. I look forward to moving the many mountains that need moving with you. And now, without further ado, please help me welcome two activists from the collective who have been reshaping the art world with their feminist critiques for decades. We don't know their real names and we won't see their faces, but we all know the work of the Gorilla Girls. What's very good about our image is that when you look at our masks, you think of what we stand for. And we stand for the conscience of the art world. And we feel that there, there is underrepresentation of women and minorities. And when you see our logo, basically, when you see our face, that's what we stand for, and it's not personal. <laughs> Women artists have never gotten the serious attention and certainly not the serious money that male artists do. Why? The Gorilla Girls, who call themselves the conscience of the art world, have plastered their answer all over town. Coming into the city right now, probably 65% of the young artists are females. And yet, less than 10% have their work shown. And that's one of the reasons I'm a gorilla girl. We believe that getting into a gallery or being shown in a museum even is for an artist an employment situation. The question was, how are you going to get women artists recognized when names, lives committed to art was completely ignored by the art history books? And so some of what we did was just attention getting. anonymous do-gooders like Robin Hood, Batman, Zorro, and the Lone Ranger. Most of the women who are doing all the bitching are completely talentless. For example, the, like the top women artists, you don't hear them making these embarrassing feminist pleas. I mean, it's just that these women, are, they don't have any talent and they're taking it out on men. Everybody who attended the Museum of Modern Art this year went up to the information desk and said, gee, where are the women artists? They put them on the walls. Anyone in the crowd? I'm going to toss it. Good catch from for you. I'm going to toss another one. Heads up. Any guys out there? One for you. Any guys who want some bananas? A guy who, yes. 
Can we catch it? Can we catch it? Good morning. There is a good principle that created order, light, and man, and an evil principle that created chaos, darkness, and women. Pythagoras, 6th century BC. Girls begin to talk and stand on their feet sooner than boys because weeds grow more quickly than good crops. Martin Luther, 1533. I consider women writers, lawyers, and politicians as monsters and nothing but five-legged calves. The woman artist is merely ridiculous, but I am in favor of the female singer and dancer, Auguste Renoir, beloved Impressionist painter. Dear group of communists, you're the strongest bunch of bitches ganged together I've ever seen in world of art. Don't think to career you will make it 80. Best work of art a woman or girl can do is in bed, making well love, and sometimes procreate non-idiot females. Feminism is the reason for high number of AIDS statistics in the United States of America. Thanks to you bitch feminists, if weakest men become gay and AIDS raise up in USA, a woman can be a genius. Do you remember the Holy Virgin, you damn bunch of whores? Answer me if you have the courage, bunch of bitches. An early letter to the Guerrilla Girls from an Italian art critic who included his calling card in the envelope. Hello, Amsterdam. We are the Guerrilla Girls. It is so wonderful to be here with the awesome Mama Cash team on International Women's Day with all of you to urge you to support the women's strike by coming to events like these. It's a very difficult time in our country and in the world, and we bet that lots of you are as nervous as we are in these times, especially now that the US nuclear codes are in the hands of someone like Donald Trump. So, to let off some tension, should we start off with a big collective cathartic scream? <laughs> okay, on three. Everyone, one, two, three. Here's a poster that we did the day after the U.S. election in 2016, and President Trump announces new commemorative months. We have this habit in the, in the U.S. Um, that honors marginalized, the struggle and, 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 and uh, heritage of marginalized groups. But under Trump, we give them each a, a, a month, like Women's History Month in March, uh, but we're terrified that these months are soon going to be changed. For example, African American History Month could be replaced by, be replaced by Ku Klux Klan Month. And LGBTQ Pride Month replaced by Pray Away the Gay Month. And Women's History Month, unfortunately, replaced by Supermodel Month. I'm Zubeda Aha, and this is Frida Kahlo. Frida is a founding member of the Guerrilla Girls and has been involved with pretty much everything the group has done. And I've been a member for close to a decade. We're a group of feminists who have devoted our lives to fighting for all human rights and against the takeover of art and culture by the rich and powerful. And most of our work has been about discrimination and corruption in art. But we've also examined other issues like film, pop culture, <clears throat> gender stereotypes, war, and income inequality. In 1985, we got the idea to put up two posters on the streets of New York about the state of marginalized artists in the New York art world. 
It wasn't a pretty picture, but we had a new idea about how to construct political art, to twist an issue around and present it in a way that it hadn't been seen before. And the Guerrilla Girls were born. We're an anonymous bunch of women artists who wear these gorilla masks in public, and we take the names of dead women artists as pseudonyms. Over 55 individuals have been members of the Guerrilla Girls, some for weeks, some for decades. We've always been diverse in age, sexual orientation, class, and from many ethnic backgrounds, South Asian, Af Asian, African American, Latin, European, etc. And we've had cis and transgender members from the very beginning. We consider ourselves intersectional feminists, and we explore how race, class, ethnicity, and gender identity affect the human rights struggles everywhere. We never expected that all hell would break loose over the posters, but we were thrilled that they caused a major crisis of conscience about diversity in the art world. That's a subject museums, collectors, and critics have ignored and denied for a long, long time. Finally, it's a no-brainer. You can't tell the story of a culture without all the voices behind it. But there's still a ton of bias and corruption in the art world, and sometimes even more so, growing corruption. And because artists get caught up in the economy of it all, it's hard for them to openly admit it. And that's another reason why after 34 years, 33 years, um, these masks are still so necessary. Our first two posters led to hundreds of others, plus street actions, billboards, stickers, and books. Not just about art, but about the worlds of film, politics, and pop culture. And who knew that 33 years later, we, the agitating outsiders, would actually end up inside museums that we actually criticize with exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art, <laughs> Tate Modern in London, where a room of our posters is on display next to Andy Warhol, <laughs> and also the Reina Sofia in Madrid. Some of our large-scale street projects include Rotterdam, Mexico City, Istanbul, Athens, and Shanghai. Retrospectives of our work have been held in Bilbao and Madrid. Oops, where are we? There we go, sorry, <laughs> how, how did I get ahead of myself? Sorry, that's, that's Bilbao. <laughs> and now, a super fantastic, unique, encyclopedic show is at the Museum of Sao Paulo in Brazil. You know, we've been so lucky to be able to do this work, and we're so grateful to the hundreds of people, thousands of people actually, all over the world, ages 8 to 80, who write to us every week telling us that we inspired them to do their own crazy kind of activism. We started out sneaking around in the middle of the night, putting up posters all over New York, posters that revealed the truth about discrimination in the New York art world. By the way, it's illegal to put a poster on a US mailbox, so no one else try that. Now we did this because we were really pissed off, but the posters caught everybody's attention and, and suddenly everyone was talking about the issues on them. Now this is an example of how bad things really were. We weren't complaining that there weren't 50% this or even 15% that, we were complaining about zero, zero, one, zero. And it was even harder for women of color. So we did this intersectional poster. Only four galleries in New York show black women. Only one shows more than one. Soon the word on the street was that the Guerrilla Girls were just a bunch of whining complainers. So negative. So we took this criticism to heart, and we decided that it was time to do a poster to help artists be more positive about their situation. The advantages of being a woman artist. <laughs> Working without the pressure of success. Not being stuck in a tenured track teaching position. 
being included in revised versions of art history. <laughs> Not having to undergo the embarrassment of being considered a genius. <laughs> and getting your picture in all those fancy art magazines wearing a gorilla mask. This poster has been translated into many languages, and hardly a week goes by when we don't get letters from people in fields as diverse as mortuary science, veterinary science, music, and physics, telling us that this poster is actually the story of their lives, too. So a few years after we did this poster, we were invited to do a billboard in Manhattan, and we decided to try out this crazy voice that we had developed on a larger audience. So one Sunday morning, we went to the Metropolitan Museum to conduct what we affectionately came to call the weenie count. Anyone know what the weenie count was? <laughs> so we counted naked males versus naked females in the artworks. When we went through the classical art section, most of the naked figures were male. When we toured the early Christian sections, there wasn't any flesh at all. In the Renaissance and Baroque paintings, the only fully frontal naked figure we could find belonged to the baby Jesus. <laughs> it was only when we arrived in the 19th and 20th century, the modern era, where sex replaced religion as the major preoccupation of European artists. That's where we found this statistic. Less than 5% of the artists are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. You know, we would like to think that our work has made a big difference in the art world, but unfortunately, old habits die hard, and some museums still lag behind. We went back to the Met a few years ago to see if anything had gotten better. We were sure it had, but this is what we found. Whoops. Ah. No. This is what we found. <laughs> Sorry. Fewer women artists, but more naked males. Is that progress? In the mid-1990s, the buzz world in the US art world was multiculturalism. Art institutions were all playing catch up, showing shows of one or two artists each of marginalized groups. But instead of showing the great diversity of artists from these groups, most museums were showing the same few artists over and over again. So we decided it was time to do a campaign about tokenism, that habit of choosing one artist to represent an entire marginalized group, and then thinking the entire problem is solved. <clears throat> so we wanted to ask the question, is tokenism a solution or merely a continuation of the problem of exclusion. So here is our top 10 signs that you're an art world token. Every one of these circumstances happened to a member of our group. Your busiest months are February, Black History Month, March, Women's History, April, Asian American Awareness, September, Latino Heritage, October, LGBTQ History and Disability Awareness, two for one, and November, Native American history. At parties and openings, the only other people of color are serving the drinks. Whenever you open your mouth, it's assumed you speak for your people, not just yourself. At parties and openings, everyone ends up telling you their interracial, gay, and transgender sexual fantasies. A museum that won't collect your work gives you a prominent place in the lecture series, like us here at the Stedlick. <laughs> Recently, we have been busier than ever, but we've been faced with a huge dilemma. What do you do when the system that you've spent your entire life attacking suddenly embraces you. Starting about 2015, um, we've been given invitations to appear at, at uh, museums and biennales all over the world. And in 2005, we were asked to do a large-scale installation at the Venice Biennale. 
Uh, so this is, what's, so what's a girl activist to do? We've agonized over it, but for now we've made the decision to participate in exhibitions and appearances at museums because we want our message to get out to as large an audience as possible. And I have to say, it's such a thrill to criticize art museums right inside their walls. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what we did in Venice, an installation of six 17-foot high posters that were the first things viewers saw in the main exhibition hall of the Arsenale. First, we took on the Biennale itself, documenting 110 years of discrimination. But we also wanted to declare it the first feminist Biennale. Why? Well, it was the first time ever in the history of the Biennale that two women were appointed curators of the exhibition. And surprise, it was the year with the highest number of women artists ever. We also took on the museums of Venice themselves. We discovered that every historical museum in Venice except one had work by female artists in their collection, but almost all of it was kept in the basements, not on the walls. So we appropriated this iconic image of Marcello Mastriani straddling Anita Ekberg from the classic Fellini film La Dolce Vita, and we asked the question, where are the women artists of Venice? The answer, underneath the men. We then demanded that viewers go to the museums of Venice and tell them to demand that they want to see more women on top. <laughs> Sexual innuendo here? When the Washington Post, which is a major US newspaper, gave us a full page as part of a special section on feminism and art, we designed our own tabloid, not okay the Gorilla Girl scandal rag, to reveal the shocking truth about how low, low, low the number of women and artists of color in the new US National Art Museums. Horror on the National Mall, thousands of women locked in basements of DC museums. Now, we got all of our statistics from the museums themselves or from their websites. And when the Washington Post, a major American newspaper of record, had to do the fact checking, they called up all the museums saying, the National Gallery, uh, is it true, can you tell us if it's a fact that at this moment there is not one artwork on display by an African American artist? They shockingly said, oh, we'll get back to you in the morning. <laughs> and the museums went bananas. The National Gallery hurriedly installed a sculpture by an artist of color, and the Hirshhorn suddenly found works it never knew it owned. <laughs> and by the way, here's how bad it was at the US National Taxpayer Supported Museums. Um, I don't know whether you can see these stats, but the National Gallery of Art was 98% male and 99.9% .9 white because they had installed overnight <laughs> one sculpture by an African-American sculptor. And the, <clears throat> the Hirshhorn Museum, which is the modern and contemporary art museum, was 95% male and 94% white. It was shocking. Lots of museums have the names of dead white males inscribed on their facades. <laughs> We've always wondered if that isn't part of the problem. Our solution? <laughs> Replacing the names like Leonardo and Michelangelo with artists like Artemisia Gentileschi, Frida Kahlo, Rosa Bonheur, Alma Thomas, and Claude Cahoon. Speaking of Claude Cahoon, we wrote about Claude in our bedside companion to the history of Western art. Claude Cahoon lived in France in the mid 20th century and made self portraits in all manner of gender roles. Now, Claude was born Lucy Schwab. Claude's life partner and step-sibling, Suzanne Malherbe, also renamed himself becoming Marcel. Some art history books on surrealism list Claude as a man, others as a woman. The Guerrilla Girls think that art history needs some new vocabulary to describe artists like 
Claude Cahoon. We love art and artists, but let's face it, while there are lots of people who care about art, there are also lots of posers, snobs, gamblers, tax dodgers, inside traders, and even criminals in our industry. The art market is unregulated. In fact, it is described as the fourth largest black market in the world after drugs, guns, and diamonds. So <clears throat> here's our version of the history of art museums taken from the Gorilla Girls Art Museum Activity Book. A brief history of museums. It all began because rich people have always had a lot of stuff. When kings, queens, emperors, and aristocrats ran out of space in their palaces and churches, they needed somewhere to store it all. Bingo! They started art museums. In many countries, museums became part of the government and are run by bureaucrats and civil servants. In the US, most museums are funded and overseen by super wealthy art collectors, the 1% of the 1%. You know, books, music, and film are cheap. They can be owned by almost everyone. But art, as you know, is expensive, super expensive. And only the rich can afford to buy it. And once collectors spend all that money, well, they want their investments to appreciate in value which tends to happen once an artwork is shown in a museum. U.S. museums receive so little government funding, they survive on donations from rich collectors. In turn, the collectors serve on museum boards, get huge tax deductions, and can influence what the museum will show. For example, Alfred Taubman, the chief stockholder of a major auction house in New York, was on the Painting and Sculpture Committee of the Whitney Museum for years. He knew in advance what the Whitney would acquire and show. And that was information that was really helpful to his business. It doesn't take a genius to realize that the system is ripe for corruption. In other fields, this kind of insider trading is illegal, but no one mentions this in the art world, American capitalism at its finest. Okay, I know there are lots of art lovers out there, so let's take a short art quiz. <laughs> of the top 100 auction sales, 2011 to 2016, how many were women artists? One! <laughs> what does art by famous females cost compared <clears throat> Whoa! You gave it away. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, all right, that was a, that was a hint. <laughs> what does art by famous females cost compared to the art by famous males? You guys got it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. The highest sale <clears throat> ever for a living female artist: nine point seven million dollars for a Katie Nolan is only 16% of the highest sale for a male, 58 million for a Jeff Koons. Next question. Can you make money from a museum while you're still on its board of directors? $11 million says yes. That's what Count Giuseppe Panza was paid for selling part of his art collection to the Museum of Com Contemporary Art in LA while he was on the board. He also sold other work from his collection to the Guggenheim that year for 30 million. What's one of the major economic forces behind the new Guggenheim Museum in Abu Dhabi? Debt bondage. Foreign workers at the Guggenheim and in the surrounding luxury zone are hired from South Asia and flown to the Emirates. When they arrive, their passports are confiscated and their pay is nothing like what they were promised. They're forced to live under inhumane conditions and work for a pittance. What's more important to the Metropolitan Museum than free speech? Any guesses? Money! The Met recently accepted 
$65 million from the ultra-right-wing Koch brothers, oligarchs who spend even more than that trying to undermine science and the U.S. elections. Well, what did the Met do after accepting their dirty money? They had a big party, then called in the cops to arrest a group of artists, the Illuminators, who protested outside the museum by projecting this image onto the muse museum, tagging the Koch brothers as climate deniers. The Met has the Koch brothers, but MoMA has Larry Fink, CEO of the multinational investment fund BlackRock, promoter of onerous student loans, and until recently, a member of Trump's business advisory council. We did this action against him inside MoMA with Occupy Museums and the Illuminator to let museum visitors know what kind of people are running the space. Now, speaking of billionaires, here's a stealth campaign that we did in New York a couple of years ago. We put up stickers about income inequality going after art collectors, galleries, and museums. And we also did a stealth projection on the facade of the Whitney Museum, uninvited, uh, on the night that they opened their new renovate, their new building, with the help of the Illuminator Collective. And here's a little video about what happened. So the world of artists is great, but the art world sucks. The super rich are controlling the museums sitting on the boards. Power is being centralized into these few rich people. Like it's really about the one percent. Unfortunately, the art world right now appears to be about money and about the production of luxury items. Billionaires are making more and more and more, and their taste controls which artists get the big bucks and get the opportunities and get the shows. We're planning to sneak around New York with the Illuminator. So we'll be starting out in Chelsea and we hope to then go to the Whitney. So we had this idea to do something we could do really fast around New York and put these stickers up. Some of the stickers are about art galleries, about billionaires, billionaire collectors, and about museums. So we wanted to put them up where they belong, on the big galleries, on the museums, and give them out to people, especially so they could do the same thing. And it seemed like a great idea. Call people together, just put the word out, see who comes, and just run around the streets and put these things up and bother people. It's going to be a Saturday in Chelsea. People walking around, feeling really good about having seen all this inspiring art. And all of a sudden, they're going to see the wall above start talking to them. And it's going to say, dear art collector. We completely get it. Collecting art is so expensive. We really understand why you can't afford to pay all your employees a living wage. The wall is going to talk to them. Every time we put something up, you know, people would go bananas. Some people would love it, some people would hate it. So we would sort of work in that space. It's really very productive to provoke people to think about things. And we discovered early on that if you could make someone who disagreed with you laugh, you know, you had a hook inside their brain. You know, once you were in there, you just might be able to change their minds about things. Now, we know that there are collectors and donors who advocate for a different art world and collect work by diverse artists. But today, there are way too many collectors who use art as an investment, then create their own museum so they can have even more control of the system. So here's a banner that we put up outside the Ludwig Museum a couple of years ago. <clears throat> and here it is in English. The advantages of owning your own art museum. You're the boss. You call the shots, just like in your own business. 
you decide what the art the museum collects and exhibits under the influence, of course, of the multinational galleries and auction houses who manipulate and define today's art market. At fancy parties, art fairs, and biennales, everyone sucks up to you. And your wallet. Your huge donations get you huge tax breaks. All the while, people think that you're an incredibly genius philanthropist. If you make the mistake of hiring progressive and inclusive directors, curators, and staff, you can just say, you're fired. We took sticker versions of this banner to the Freeze Art Fair in London in October 2016, but we were immediately busted by the fair when we started putting them up and giving them out. Which makes us ask, why isn't there freedom of expression at art fairs? We're headed to Art Basel Hong Kong at the end of this month to do a project about gender discrimination among the galleries at the fair. Stay tuned via Facebook and Instagram to find out what happens. Um, as you can see, we think a lot about museums. And in the fall of 2016, we opened two new projects in London. Uh, and for our Whitechapel Gallery exhibition, we decided to find out what museums think about themselves. We sent out 383 questionnaires to art institutions all over Europe and the UK and made an exhibition from the 101 responses we received. And as for the 282 that didn't respond, we put their names on the floor <laughs> so that viewers to the gallery could walk all over them. Fun fact, none of the email addresses that we were given for the Stedlick worked, and they weren't included on the wall or the floor. So today, we are inviting them to fill out that questionnaire. Anyone have an email that'll work? <laughs> OK, in case you want to find out <clears throat> a little bit of what they said. Only two of the responding institutions claim to have more than 40% women artists in their collection. A Finnish museum told us that women artists have been a hugely important part of their collection since 1861. But today, there are only 12% women artists in that collection. The Reina Sofia claims that they think about diversity all the time. But their collection is still 87% white men. Billionaire art collector Dakas Janu told us that gender and race aren't important at his private art museum. The only thing that matters is pure talent. We asked him, what planet do you live on? The show ended with this statement. Don't let museums reduce art to the small number of artists who have won a popularity contest among big time dealers, curators, and collectors. Unless museums show art as diverse as the culture they represent, they're not showing the history of art. They're just preserving the history of wealth and power. Remembering that early criticism that we were just a bunch of whining complainers at the Take Modern, we decided to create the first ever Gorilla Girls Complaints Department. <laughs> and over a week, thousands of people came by the museum to complain about art, gender issues, racism, politics, and the museum itself. Our complaints department was in Brazil last fall, and we'd love to see the complaint department on the mall in Washington, D.C., and maybe here at the Stedlick. <laughs> okay, write your letters, send a petition. <laughs> okay, let's, um, let's get away from the art world, and let's talk about an area of U.S. culture that's actually worse than the art world. Hollywood. The film industry loves to think of itself as edgy and progressive and ahead of the curve. But if you look behind the scenes at writers, directors, editors, you'll find almost all of them are white males. So starting in 2002, we began renting billboards in Hollywood with the help of some unnamed uh, female directors 
just a few blocks from where the Academy Awards were held at the same time as the award ceremony. And for our first one in 2002, we decided it was time to put a little realism into the Academy Awards. <clears throat> we redesigned the golden boy to look more like the guys who take him home. The anatomically correct Oscar. He's white and male, just like the guys who win. Now, that's an outrageous statement, and we had to back it up with some facts. And at that point, no woman had ever won Best Director. 94% of the, act, the writing awards had gone to men, and only 3% of the acting awards had been given to actors of color. Now that was the very year that both Denzel Washington and Halle Berry won Oscars for their performance. And we're convinced it was because of this billboard. It was us. It was all us. <laughs> A few years later, Monique, Octavia Spencer, and Lupita Nyong'o became the fifth, sixth, and seventh black women in 86 years to win Oscars for acting. Jeffrey Fletcher and John Ridley became the first black men to win for screenwriting, and Catherine Bigelow became the first woman to win Best Director, and only the fourth ever nominated. And last week, we had another black man win an Oscar for writing, Jordan Peele, for Get Out. And of course, we take credit for that too. All of it. <laughs> Last year, 14 years after we started our anti-Oscar movement in the middle of the Oscar So White scandal, we updated three of our anti-Hollywood billboards in Minneapolis. This is my favorite. <laughs> Even the U.S. Senate is more progressive than Hollywood. Okay, let's go on to the music industry. Pharrell Williams invited us to be in a show in Paris about femininity. And we did a new poster for it, including this version of our best known poster. Do women have to be naked to get into music videos while 99% of the men are fully dressed? <clears throat> We've also done lots of posters about politics and social issues. In 2009, we did a poster about hatred <clears throat> of and violence against females that appeared on the streets of Montreal for the 20th anniversary of the worst mass murder in Canada ever when a gunman claiming he was fighting feminism went into the Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal, separated the women students from the male students, and proceeded to shoot and kill 14 women studying engineering at the Ecole Polytechnique. Our poster is a graffiti wall of sexist hate speech throughout the centuries, including Confucius, who said 100 women are not worth a single testicle, and Pat Robertson, who said feminism is a socialist, anti-family movement that encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, destroy capitalism, and worst of all, become lesbians. <laughs> you know, it struck us that it's still okay to publicly say things about women and trans women that wouldn't be acceptable if said about other groups. Case in point, Donald Trump, who brags about sexual assault and abuses women continuously. You know, almost all women and many men and trans people have been sexually harassed and or abused in the workplace. Guys in power do this, and other guys in power have let them get away with it over and over again. Now so many of us are speaking out and telling our stories too. Any more stories out there to join the movement? Oh my gosh, what a well-behaved crowd. <laughs> you know, we take on all kinds of issues. <clears throat> and last, well, actually two years ago, we published a book about a topic that's very important to us, and that is the female body and how it's been treated. So we're very excited to present it to you tonight. The hysterical Her Story of Hysteria and How It Was Cured 
from ancient times until now. <clears throat> and it gives us the opportunity to sing to you. And I have to apologize for that. <laughs> <clears throat> Still crazy after all these years. Once upon a time, women in Europe and America suffered from a terrible female disease called hysteria. The symptoms were nervousness, fatigue, anxiety, insomnia, faintness, muscle spasms, shortness of breath, irritability, headaches, heaviness of the abdomen, fluid retention, lack of concentration, depression, loss of appetite for food or sex, ticklishness, and making trouble. <laughs> Doctors claim that two out of every Three women suffered from this awful affliction. No one knew what caused hysteria, but the great minds of science decided it had to have something to do with women's mysterious sexual organs. Of course. <clears throat> something in the way she moves. In ancient Greece, Plato believed the uterus wandered around the female body, choking and strangling all normal functions as it went. We're not making this up. <laughs> Pleased to meet you. Guess you know my name. No sympathy for the devil. In the Middle Ages, people thought he uh, females who showed extreme symptoms of hysteria were possessed by the devil. They had to be witches. Among the cures, burning at the stake and hanging. Hit me with your best shot. <laughs> In the Renaissance, special instruments were developed to purge women of hysteria. Lots of Dutch houses, maybe unknown to you, had a wooden syringe like this in the outhouse. It was hollow and it shot medicinal fluids deep into one's vagina to flush out all that unsavory stuff deep inside that was the cause of hysteria. <laughs> in Italy, a device like the one at the bottom was used to fumigate female genitals with hot vapors. Ouch. And then there was Dr. Feelgood. <laughs> Another treatment for hysteria, if you could afford it, involved a physician gently massaging the inside edges of a pa patient's vagina with aromatic oils. If the procedure was successful, the patient would fall into a frenzied state of groaning and moaning, sometimes over and over again. <laughs> it was not unusual for the patient to lose consciousness or even fall asleep. When revived, she was in a state of complete calm relaxation until her next episode of hysteria. Some fortunate women had this procedure as often as once a week. It proved especially effective on virgins, widows, and nuns. <laughs> Sometimes the treatment took a couple minutes. Other times it took Hours. <laughs> what a lot of work for those doctors. <laughs> okay, everyone, reality check. Doctors gave patients orgasms and got paid for it. <laughs> Is that health care or prostitution? Good vibrations. After the electric motor was invented in the 19th century, doctors came up with exciting new ways to treat the ever-present problem of female hysteria. They used newfangled vibrating machines directly on their patients' genitals. And once electricity became available in private homes, the cure for hysteria could be administered right in the privacy of one's bedroom. Fun fact. Portable vibrators appeared 10 years before vacuums and irons. <laughs> Priorities. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sears and Roebuck, a popular American mail order uh, catalog store, had a version with special attachments, which meant that once the patient felt better, she could clean the house with the same machine. Amazing. <laughs> Girls just want to have fun. The porn industry discovered the vibrator in the 1920s. Psychiatrists were horrified to see right there on the screen a medical device you being used for sexual pleasure. Quickly, vibrators in America were declared lascivious and immoral. Stores stopped selling them. As late as 2008, it was still a crime to sell vibrators in Texas. It's still illegal in Alabama. <laughs> R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Vibrators became the best friend of many a girl and are still at the center of a thriving sex toy industry. But around 1952, the medical profession dropped hysteria as a serious, registered, identified female disease. That just so happened to be the very same year that Simone de Beauvoir published her manifesto, The Second Sex, which jump-started the women's liberation movement. Coincidence? Feminism has helped everyone understand how society has constrained, misunderstood, and mistreated female bodies over the centuries. So maybe it was feminism, the medicine, that cured the disease of hysteria. A few years ago, the Guerrilla Girls gave our first ever commencement address at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in front of 4,000 cheering people and a few angry parents. <laughs> it's become our manifesto, the Guerrilla Girls' Guide to Behaving Badly, which you have to do most of the time in the world as we know it. So we made a little video of our manifesto. Actually, it's a rant. Um, and we're going to show it tonight and end our program with it. Here it is. The Gorilla Girl's Guide to Behaving Badly, which you have to do most of the time in the world as we know it. Be a loser. The world of art doesn't have to be an Olympics where a few win and everyone else is forgotten. The art market and its hyper-competitive celebrity culture makes everyone but the stars feel like failures. But there's another world out there that's not about raging egos, a world of artistic cooperation and collaboration. That's the one we joined and we invite you to join it too. Let's make trouble together. Be crazy. Political art or activism that points to something and says, this is bad. It's just preaching to the converted. Instead, try to change people's minds and do it in some unforgettable way. A trick we learned is humor helps you fly under the radar. If you can get people who disagree with you to laugh at an issue, you have a hook right into their brain. Once there, you have a much better chance to convert them. Be anonymous. Sometimes you gotta speak out publicly, but sometimes it works even better to speak out anonymously. Now this has its disadvantages, like working your whole life without getting any credit, but it has lots of advantages too. Our anonymity, for example, keeps the focus on the issues and away from our personalities. The mystery of who we might be draws lots of attention to the issues we promote. Plus, you won't believe what comes out of your mouth while wearing a gorilla mask. Be an outsider. Even if you're working inside the system, we say act like an outsider. Seek out the understory, the subtext, the overlooked, and the downright unfair. Then expose it. Jam your culture. Remake your institution. Just do one thing. If it works, do another. If it doesn't, do another anyway. Don't be paralyzed if you don't get it right every time. Just keep chipping away. We promise that bit by bit, your efforts will add up to something effective. Artists, don't make only expensive art that billionaire art collectors can afford. Curators, don't exhibit only the expensive art your trustees donate. Let's have more cheap art that everyone can own, like books, zines, music, and movies, like our posters. Show museums tough love. It's unethical 
critical that wealthy art collectors who invest lots of money in art can become museum trustees overseeing institutions that in turn validate their investments. It's a lousy way to write and preserve our history. Demand ethical standards inside museums. No more conflicts of interest or insider trading. No more cookie cutter collections of art that cost the most. Convince art collectors their collections are inferior with only work by white male artists. Don't let museums perpetuate this version of art and power with a few tokens thrown in. Make sure your favorite museum casts a wider net and collects the whole story of our culture. Whether you work in a museum or a classroom, don't teach an art history constructed by corrupt institutions. Do like we did. Write your own. Complain, complain, complain. Be a creative complainer. Be a professional complainer. Don't assume people know what's missing from museums. Rem Remind them how many modern and contemporary art collections still contain less than 15% females and artists of color. Use the F word, feminism. We think it's crazy that so many people who believe in the tenets of feminism are still afraid to call themselves feminists. Feminism doesn't get the respect it deserves. Women's rights, civil rights, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights, and Black Lives Matter are the great human rights movements of our times. Feminists like us who believe in intersectionality fight for all human rights. No one is free until everyone is free. Feminism is changing the world. It's revolutionizing human thought, given many people lives their great-grandparents could never have imagined. But there's still so much work to do. There are so many countries worldwide where LGBTQ people and women have little or no human rights. 90% of transgender employees have faced discrimination or harassment at work. In the U.S., no federal law protects them, even though nearly 80% of voters support such a law. Then there's rampant sexism in the tech industry, including the harassment of female gamers. And what about the gender earning gap that the U.S. Congress refuses to move against? Violence and abuse against women, gay, and transgender people is still a huge international problem. From gang rape in India to kidnappings in Nigeria to sexual slavery by ISIS to the next negligible punishment given out for domestic violence in America. Trans women are assaulted and even murdered in the U.S. But despite all this bad news, feminist resistance movements are exploding all over the world. Let's make the F-word feminism the F-word for the future. Let's all join together with feminists on the right side of history. And please welcome Marguerite from from the Stedlick to the stage. You're a great, you know, a really good sport to be. <laughs> oh my God. I feel abuse. like a loser already. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much. My name is Margriet Schaafmaker, and I'm I had the flu for five days, so my voice I can't speak loud as mm -hmm. loud as I normally can. And uh, but thank you also for being here and having me here on the stage. And uh, because, yeah, you made some points very clear <laughs> that, um, you know, we have not been answering your questionnaire. Um, this is just so a minor happy. detail because, of course, especially also the last points, and I have to make that clear, and most of the people who sit here and also down the entrance area know that uh, this museum is right now in a very precarious situation, very much in relation to, of course, this, this relation between private funding and mm -hmm. uh, public funding. And um, right now we're still awaiting two research being conducted right now on you know, what this means for the future of this museum, because this is a public slash private institution, which makes it, of course, very complicated. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so this is, of course, one... <laughs> thing that we have been struggling with and that we're trying to do is, you know, as good as possible. So you're, you're really um, hitting the nail <laughs> and, uh, there. So, um, yeah, we have half an hour, at least I'd like to see, well, a little less, because of course there's a lot of other programs going on later on as well. Um, so you have some questions for me, I have some questions for you, and of course you must have a lot of questions too. 
and uh, perhaps most of all for the Gorilla Girls, but if there's critical questions to the Stalic, of course, I'm happy to give answers as well. I think to save time, we will defer our questions to you and to the audience because we've already said a whole lot. Yeah. That's true. But um, yeah, for me, it's, it's, um, I've been uh, dying to hear what you, I mean, I know you guys have been visiting, girls, sorry, you girls have been <laughs> visiting um, uh, the, the museum yesterday also, and you've been um, looking at the, the new collection presentation. And I've been uh, partly responsible, together with Beatrix Roof and the curatorial team, for this whole new presentation, uh, in which we, although our motto is uh, um, questioning instead of confirming, the whole idea of this whole new base presentation is about showing the highlights. And of course, this is confirming in a way. Yeah. And this is this was very much a struggle for us in the team because um, looking at our collection, 90,000 objects. Um, if roughly 29,000 producers uh, that are male and 1,300 of them are female, so we have a 4.4% female artist, which is very low, I know. In this collection presentation, we tried really to, to bring out female voices. I hope you've noticed that also. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's not more than 12% in the end. I was really disappointed by that because I, I thought we made a really big effort. Yeah. And, um, and of course there's a dual model, an agonistic model, because on the ground floor in the old part of the building there's the Stalic Turns exhibitions, and these are new reads of the collection, new uh, perspectives, and these will bring out other voices that will be translated back to the base. So in five years' time, we. We hope to bring out a sort of transformation of this canon and, and change that. But still, it is limiting. It is 12%. It's yeah, not nearly enough. Well, maybe so, you should stop collecting art by white men for <laughs> five years and <laughs> make up for it. But you know, it's, it's good that you know the numbers because so many institutions, when we sent out our questionnaires, and one of the questions we asked was, have you done statistics on your collections and your exhibition records? So many said no. So acknowledging is the first yeah. step to recovery. So yeah. well done. <laughs> I mean, it gave some pressure that you guys were coming, of course. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I must say that in exhibitions, um, actually, and Goldstein and Beatrix Roof both were very much more open-minded and, and focusing on solo shows by, by uh, female artists. So that actually, the past four years, has been about 40% to 45%. Which the, the math was done by different people in the organization, so I'm not yeah, clear yeah, yeah. what numbers. Were. But that is okay-ish, I think. I mean, it could be better even. Mm -hmm. So, But on the exhibition level, actually, it's not that bad. But it's very much on the acquisitions yeah. that I'm really still very worried. And uh, I think we can do so much better. And I'm not even talking about people of color and, and non-Western uh, mm -hmm. versus Western, because this is really even more outrageous, the numbers. So it is a problem. Could we suggest you think about all of it at the same time, rather than to separate women from... Yeah, but if you talk about uh, <laughs> quantifying it, um, yeah. uh, you know, what, ask, what, what numbers do you want to know? And I totally agree. I yeah. mean, it's, yeah. uh, um, we've been very much working with the team yeah. towards uh, the whole topic of inclusion and diversity, and you're yeah. so right, bring that all on the table. Yeah. But if you're talking about exact numbers, you have to know what, what are you yeah. asking, sure. you know? Yeah, sure. sure. Well, maybe you should think about it as white males versus everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, that Your makes it really is sharp. such a cleansing process. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you, because um, in the Netherlands, I'm actually I'm very inspired by a lot of organizations and institutions that are working uh, towards changing this. I mean, we have Frame Your Framed, we have um, uh, the Museum of, uh, of Equality, we have um, well our own project Studio I with the Van Appen Museum, a platform for inclusive culture. Um, there's there's many things that are that are happening, and I was wondering if you guys are. Are you seeing changes in in um, in what is happening, or are you still as critical as as you started in '85? And then I'm looking at you, but of course, <laughs> younger generation also. What do you see? Is the world changing a bit? You know, I think the conversation has changed. When the Gorilla Girls started in '85, and they said 
there's no art by women and artists of color, the response they got was, oh, they're not making work that's good enough. No one, and curators would say that. No one would say that now. Now there is this understanding that there's systemic obstacles that women, artists of color, artists of other minorities face that straight white men don't. But what's troubling is because everybody realizes that there's this consciousness shift, people think that it's been solved. And it isn't until we show them the numbers that they're like, oh, but we're still favoring the white dudes, you know? So the, the, the tone has changed. That's true. Yeah. And I was um, a bit struck by that as well, because, I mean, I really, after, you know, working so hard with Beatrix on this whole selection procedure, and then you, in the end, you do the numbers, and yeah. you see, shit, you know, yeah. 12%, and yeah. then we couldn't change anything anymore because, you know, we had given all the lists, and, and the restoration people had already signed off on it. And you're so disappointed. And, of course, we have some major st statements, like the Barbara Kruger here outside. Yeah. I mean... And we have a space um, also devoted to the issue of, of gender, yeah. um, which I was happy about. Although you made a very critical remark this afternoon about that space, the gallery text that I wrote uh, oh. in that. <laughs> Did you write that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was so happy with it. And then. Do you want, to, want me to say something? Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Now you can bring well, it up. Well, we were surprised. I mean, we're always happy to see a little room that says feminism. Uh, and of course, it's at the end of the 80s, right? It's the end of the first section. And they're all women. Um, it would be great, first of all, to see some male feminists because it's not just our issue, right? <clears throat> they're all women in that room. And then on the wall label, the only reference to a theoretical writer was a reference to... Michel Foucault. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you're such yeah. a good sport no. for bringing it <laughs> <Yeah>. up. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you're so right. And I was like, oh, shit, you know. It could have so easily been Judith Butler or Lucy Regret. Why did I do that? I know. But it's like 200 gallery texts. And I was, we were... With, with another woman. I was writing these, like, like rah, you know, going nights and nights on. But uh, no, it's stupid. And, yeah. it, and then now I see through your eyes, and I'm like, oh, why? You know, I so. thought that a guy wrote it. I <laughs> no, I <laughs> did <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, even if you try to do it right, and you think, oh, my, I made a good statement in this room. Yeah. And actually, there are some guys there, actually. So you have to go back there. Everyone it's not only... Is. No, it is. Gijs Bakker, who actually made the, the design inside uh -huh. the... Yeah. He's a guy. Uh, yeah, okay. so there's some... Uh -huh. <laughs> so, the drawing table. Yeah, but, uh, are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, this is, I think, a very good moment to have questions. Is there also running? Yeah, and all, all wait for uh, the microphone to come up because otherwise people in the entrance area cannot hear us. Yeah, yeah Patricia. Hi, thank you for this uh, wonderful talk. I have a question about um, your research. Did you do research um, about the personnel who is working in the museum? Uh, are there did you do research on people of color being on significant places in the museum? Because I think this is a part of the problem. Yeah. Um, and is there, are there any figures available about this? Or? To be honest, we're not really social scientists. And we sort of go after, uh, we do it backwards. We decide, you know, <laughs> we decide what, we wanna, what our target is and we work backwards and try to find if the statistics support it. So we haven't done that yet, but that's a great idea. You know, actually, the New York State actually did a study, uh, which was about the, I think it was called the Cultural Data Project, and they asked about, they asked each cultural institution about the makeup of their staff and board, and they published that study uh, last year, and it was, I mean, it wasn't surprising, but it was still unbelievable how strong straight, white, and male, those in power at these institutions were. But then all their diversity numbers jumped when you looked at the full staff because all the lower level yes, were women, exactly. people of color. That's where you have, you know, everyone's feeling good about having people with disabilities. But who's making the decisions? It's a white guy at the top. So there are other people who have done that kind of study. And in fact, when we did our um, Whitechapel questionnaire, when we sent that out, a, lot, uh, a couple of the people who wrote back said the exact same thing. They're like, why don't you ask about the makeup of the uh, institutions themselves? So it's, it's super important to consider. Hi. 
<laughs> My name is Lisa. Um, I just want to start off by saying that I'm always very in inspired by what you do. I'm I love your t-shirt. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it too. I'm very proud of it. Um, I study advertising and um, I was wondering uh, about your opinion and your views on um, advertising as an art form and then also the representation of females as uh, ad advertising creators, but also in advertisements. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that because advertising is so specific to different cultures. Um, is it an art? Well, I think anything that's done well is an art. Uh, however, advertising is supposed to sell something to you, um, which I think is could be problematic. However, to be honest, we use a lot of techniques from advertising That's what I was uh, <laughs> because some of us may have had or do have day jobs, you know, um, in advertising. But I think in terms of the representation of women, I can't speak to the women behind the decisions being made in advertising, but I think we know what the, <laughs> the way the advertising world treats women when they're the objects of the ads. You know, it's, it's just like the music industry and the art world. Probably better. Better or worse? <laughs> better, better. Okay. I think music and art in Hollywood is often worse and you expect it to be better, but it's often worse. I see. Yeah, yeah. More questions, yeah. First row, yeah. Uh, hi. Um, I th uh, so kind of uh, what I was wondering, do you ever get kind of discouraged because you've been going on for so long and then do you think there's ever a time when you can kind of put down the mask and be done or is it just something that can go on forever? <laughs> <laughs> well, we do, we do fight a lot. Collective work is, you know, collective decisions are tough. But in terms of putting down the mask, I mean, there's still so much work to be done, you know? You know, thousands of years of patriarchy are not going to be righted by, what, 150 years of feminist thought? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I would love to be able to stop doing this, but uh, it ain't in the, you know, ain't, ain't in the, ain't in the books. <laughs> Can we get past the front row for questions? Oh, a little bit past the front row. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you mentioned at the beginning as the right representation of like lower and working classes, but then didn't really touch on it again. And I'm just wondering like where. Uh, like the Gorilla Girl stances on sort of like lower income artists? Well, it kind of ties into the whole, our, our big campaign against the income inequality in the art world kind of feeds into all of that. Um, I don't know if this is a problem so much here, but in America, so much of the art world is dependent on free labor. Everyone has to do a free internship for like two years before they can get a job at a museum or a gallery. And who can afford to do a free internship? Someone who has a mom or a dad who can float them for a summer while they do that. And that feeds into the fact that the, there's obstacles for people entering the art world. So we're, we're sort of very against the class divide that exists in the art world. And it also exists in American art schools because, you know, our universities are mostly private and even the public ones are very expensive. Um, and uh, students go into debt, you know, $100,000 in debt for an education. Uh, and that sort of eliminates, um, you know, a lot of people from considering art because, you know, you're facing a huge debt. So we have huge systemic problems in our country that are based on economic class as well. And they're not getting any better. You know, we have, we have a treasonous president who has somehow convinced uh, working Americans that he's on their side, despite you know, everything <laughs> he does to undercut them. Um, hi. Um, how do you become a Gorilla Girl? Open source, can I start tomorrow? How does it work? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we get that question a lot. We wish we could have everybody become a Gorilla Girl, but we don't actually need more Gorilla Girls. We need more masked feminist Avengers. We need a choir as opposed to other people just joining what we're saying. So instead of becoming a Gorilla Girl, form your own group. It was actually interesting that you, because we advertised this um, event first with a photograph of 
what we thought were guerrilla girls <laughs> protesting in front of the Stalic Museum in the mid 90s, right? Yeah. And then you guys, uh, girls, sorry, mailed us and said, what are you doing? This is not us. You know? <laughs> <laughs> These were copycats. And it's actually still, the photograph is still on the timeline when you go down to the Stalic Base exhibition. Yeah. Well, look, we're, we're, yeah. you know, we're not disavowing um, the uh, issues in, in that photograph. Um, yeah. We're just saying it wasn't us. It was, it was so, probably some activists who were inspired by us and maybe they're... Maybe someone yeah, is somebody here who knows that? <laughs> That's hard. Are the copycats here? If you did, thank you so much. <laughs> um, but it's time to find your own crazy name and go out on your own and make more trouble. And please come talk to us afterwards. We want to, uh, we want to know. More questions. I see. Hi, oh, this is loud. Um, I would like to know a little bit about your opinion between the relation um, between the Me Too movement and especially classical art museums, because surprise, surprise, museums are very behind on this. And yeah, yeah I would like. Yeah, to I mean, some... it's no surprise at all that the art world is just as bad as Hollywood and just as bad as everywhere else. The Me Too move. We are not absolved of that. And we 100% support the Me Too movement. About time. Yeah, several prominent uh, American artists have either lost their jobs or lost uh, art shows uh, or had um, very um, uh, unflattering labels written <laughs> about them. And uh, um, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. I was wondering about the bit where you were uh, at the school giving the presentation. Did this actually influence the curriculum at that institute? I'm We'd like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what is exciting, I think what one of my most favorite things to say as a guerrilla girl, especially to young students or people who are in art school, consider alternatives. We sell posters for $20. As an artist, you can have an impact on culture without making expensive paintings and sculptures. So think beyond that myth, that one story that you're told to follow in art school. And actually, that is interesting. We, when preparing this, you also explained to me that it's so easy right now to sort of communicate your ideas much more easy when you, than when you started. Yeah. And also to, to bring out pop-up exhibitions. I mean, there's no cost in sending all these fantastic files of the posters and all the things you've been producing. So do you see that as a sort of benefit, this whole new world in yeah, a way that we, we're living in? We can have four or five retrospectives simultaneously all over the world, which is great. You know, it's, it's not so much to uh, aggrandize us, but to spread our message. But we do have to charge a rental fee because, you know, we, we have to eat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we send out exhibitions as, as um, you know, as computer files. So uh, an institution can just print them up, design their crazy installation like they did in uh, Sao Paulo and um, bingo, the gorilla girls have invaded another place. <laughs> More questions? Any complaints? Any rants? Yeah, critical complaints. Oh, there's some, oh, sorry. All the way at the back. <clears throat> Uh, great presentation. I got a complaint. I haven't heard you about um, the elderly. Have you ever taken it up for the older people? Maybe some of us are elderly. <laughs> <laughs> but we do, you know, we, we talk about diversity a lot. And oftentimes when people hear us talking about diversity, they think we only mean people of color. And that's not true. We talk about all forms of diversity, even the forms of diversity that might not be so visible. You know, uh, socioeconomic diversity, ability diversity, age diversity, definitely. So it's really important to consider all forms of diversity. Um, do you think getting your mes message across has changed a lot in terms of like digitalization? And obviously, like in the 80s, the advertising aesthetic was really appealing and that has carried on to today but is that as effective as you, like do you think that still works as well to communicate your 
Well, the internet was a, <clears throat> computers and the internet were a great gift to us. You know, our early posters were sort of done by press type. <laughs> and, and they were hard to do. They were labor intensive and we had to put them up in the street. And the minute we put them up in the street, someone would paste something on top and it was, it was annoying. But we did target an audience. We knew, and we were pretty lucky. I mean, we were just flying by the seat of our pantyhose. <laughs> um, and that, that along came the internet and, and the in computers, and immediately we could start to design. We could use color, and then we could actually send things out all over the world. And uh, I remember the thrill of email getting letters from women in Saudi Arabia, women in China, women in Russia, you know, telling us about how they saw our work. And it was, it was stunning. It was just mind-boggling and stunning. And social media has really amplified that too. Um, you know, just when we posted about coming here, all of a sudden so many people are telling their friends who live in Amsterdam that they have to come see us here. So it's been a great amplifier. Sorry, can I continue? Um, do, you, do you think that that has, the, like in terms of the value of protest, do you think, I know that in terms of globalization and like communicating across is amazing, but do you think that in terms of the like quality of, of the visual or maybe the like actual thing itself has weakened? Because what do you think? Sounds like you have an answer. No, no, not at all. I'm, I'm just curious. I just, I think that like people are trying to fight this uh, to, to be activists and I think the strongest way is the way you start and I think digitalization makes it easier to appear an activist rather than be one. Oh, be an activist? Mm -hmm. Well, that sure happened in the American elections, didn't it? <laughs> Online? Uh, I don't know. I mean, everything has its, uh, you know, dangerous and dark side, um, and we have to be vigilant, and uh, we also have to hold people accountable for the internet um, and to keep it democratic and keep it from being misused and keep it from being fraudulent and keep it from uh, disseminating information that's clearly false. I think we have time for two more questions. And then I want to join forces again with the people that are in the entrance area. Yeah. Patricia. Well, I have a complaint. Go. Oh, Last year, there was a huge women's march. 15,000 women appeared, predominantly white. A week later, there was an anti-racism march. 800 people came. That's my complaint. 18, May of 18, March, sorry, May of 8, March this year, there will be a huge anti-racism demonstration. And I will ask you all here right now to attend, to be solidar, because we need solidarity. That's my complaint. It's of course what you also raised, eh, Frida. It's what you raised just as well in response to me. Yes. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, don't make the division all, anymore. Yeah, no yeah. one is free until yeah. everyone is free. Yeah. Good point. Well, one more complaint or questions, and afterwards, yeah, I see one last hand. Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. And I was wondering, because you use humor as a way to uh, bring across your message, um, was it difficult to find a balance in between, like, talking about these very serious things, but in a humorous way, and still being taken seriously? You know, there's a, a long tradition of the oppressed using humor against the oppressor because sometimes it's the only weapon you have. And we discovered that early on. And we also discovered that in talking to someone who disagrees with you, if you can make that person laugh, you have a commonality and you're inside their brain and you can perhaps change them. You know, I sometimes have a hard time like when we made the poster about um, the commemorative months that was still it was such a raw moment for me I I had a hard time being like I, I can't laugh about this yet you know but it is really important to make fun of the oppressor because that's the one thing they can't stand they can't stand it <laughs> Thank you.
Well, I think that's um, a great final statement in a way. <laughs> and um, I would like to thank you both so much for being here, for, for making this Women's Day a fantastic day here in Amsterdam with Mama Cash here at the Stedelijk. And I want a big hand of applause again to thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're a good sport. You're a good sport. We'll be working on it. We'll be working on it. I want to thank you guys also. So many of you have shown up. And, uh, but the program is not over. We're open till 11.30, oh, wow. which is quite late for us. And we really look forward to having a drink with you. So we want to invite you to go downstairs because there is, of course, Ruby Savage and Josephine Chime from the London-based In Flames Collective DJing for us. There is the Live Model Drawing Workshop, which you've also seen. And the results will be almost finished, I think. And these are trained and guided by Marilyn Sonnefeld. And of course, from 9.30 onwards here in front of the um, uh, auditorium in the Barbara Kruger installation, there will be the open mic sessions. And uh, these, these will be run by uh, Jolien Spicht and Sayonara Stuttgart. And I really look forward. A lot of you have subscribed already. It's an, an interesting program. But first, all go downstairs. Let's have a drink and rock on. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.